All right, so we are on creating our histogram. Example 2.9 from the text. How many hours classmates are playing video games? And we ensured that our lowest point in our data was a zero. The highest point in our data was a 24. And generally, we like to pick anywhere between five and 10 different intervals to create a frequency table. Anything less than five doesn't really give you a very good picture of the variance between these variable groups. And anything over 10 is a mess. And it just doesn't make a histogram look very nice or visualize your data very nice. So looking at the spread of it being 24, a good guess is to divide by eight. Eight groups makes it look really presentable. And it just worked out 24 divided by eight is three. So we chose to group these in, eight, in um, threes. So we went from zero to three, four to seven, eight to 11, 12 to 15, 16 to 19, 20 to 23, and 24 to 27. So how many were in our zero to three group? We have zero for sure. Is there anything else under three hours? What? Is there a two? Yep, so we have two in here. <coughs> so remember you have hours, and this is the frequency, right? And then the relative frequency equals frequency divided by what? N. And that, right? The relative frequency or that percentage is what we want to chart. Okay, so we have two in that one. What's between four and seven? How many? Just the 5.5? Set. Oh, you guys. I see a 7.5 in there. We going to do with it? Does it? Well, so if you remember when they were looking at categories, the one is here and a two is here, the point five is right in the middle. So if the way we divided this, right, we would have the seven here and the eight here and the 7.5 would be in the middle. So we'd have to decide if that 7.5 means it really is included in this interval because it's now, so this is where we get into a conversation about upper and lower real limits. You are upper real limit or lower real limit are these 0.5s. So if you look at this number, 7.58, Eight point five. 7.5 is the lower real limit of 8 and 8.5 is the upper real limit of 8. So under the percentage of this category, this interval will actually span to the 0.5 to create the accuracy. So if 7.5 is technically a lower real limit of eight, which category do you think we should put in it based on how we divided this? Is 7.5 also the upper real limit of seven though? Oh, I love it. Oh. So it could be seven because it's the upper real limit of seven. So what do we do with 7.5, you guys? Mm -hmm. 
either or. Well, you could, but you can't do both because then you doubled your data. So the real question becomes, this is why it's so important for you to make logical sense with how you divide these categories. Let's open it up and see what they decided. They kept it simple and went by fives. Way smarter, <laughs> right? So as you're starting to do this, and I did this on purpose because you're in charge. Remember that. You're in charge of your statistic experience. You're in charge of your data presentation. And if you think your frequency table looks like crap, and you don't like that there's a have in there that you don't know what to do with it, change the width of your frequency table, y'all. Make it look better. So let's change the width of our frequency table because I don't like that halfsy. Did you like that 7.5? Mm -hmm. Did that make your brain go, I don't like this game. Change the frequency width. We can do that. That is legal. All right. So now we're going to switch it and we're going to fives. So by moving to a frequency width of five, we've got zero to five. We've got six to what? And then you've got 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and then 10. And they just grouped it in fives. And so then they did, instead of a percentage, they just did the number. They just opted for the number of students. And they were able to go from zero to what, 10. And graph it up. But when you really want to present accurate data, the percentage kind of gives you a better idea. Because do I know what, I mean, we look at this and we can tell that most students are spending how many hours on the weekends playing video games in this sample? They, not a lot of time or a lot of time? The majority of this sample spends a lot of time playing video games. But we don't know percentages, we just know numbers and we still have to what about the percentage? Calculate it or guess, right? So that's why if you plot a relative frequency rather than the actual number, you're now going to get an idea of a third of my sample, a fifth of my sample. Here, we know that, okay, I had nine students, and then we had seven, and then we had four. So then you still have to kind of add them all up to get an idea of how many out of that whole does this really represent. So although this is pretty and it looks great, it's just the numbers, it's not, they did not plot a relative frequency, they just plotted the number. Do you see the difference? And why that relative frequency even adds another level of explanation to your data. All right, any questions on histograms? Cool. So now what we wanna do is we wanna go into how do we actually locate all of these things? And in order to locate data, again, it goes back to that really important conversation of learning about the percentage under the curve. And a, a really important thing about locating data is learning about quartiles or percentiles. And so 
One of the things that helps you understand a quartile and a percentile is also a measure of central tendency called your median. And does anyone know what a median is? What's a median? The middle. There's a median down the road to divide the middle of the road, right? A median just means the middle. So what's a median in your data? The, the middle of your data. Here's the kicker about the middle of your data. The middle of your data might not actually be one of your data points. Let's say that again. The middle of your data might not even be one of your data points. So if the middle of your data is 55.5, but everyone selected either 53 or 57, and other numbers on either side, no one actually selected that but because you had an even amount of scores, that was the middle of your data. When you have an odd number of scores, the middle of your data are easy to find because why? Number, if I have 13 numbers, will I be able to count the very middle number? Yes, there's always six on each side of that seventh number, yes? Middle of my data, always, make sense? But I have 14 numbers. Where's the middle of my data? You have to add the two middle numbers and divide by two. And that's your middle data point. So again, it might be a point that's actually not in your data. Does that make sense? But that's only when you have even numbers. When you have an odd number, it's very easy to count the middle number. Cool? So finding the median when you have an even number is you just take those two middle and divide by two. That's the middle of the middle. Everyone with me on medians? Thumbs up. Yahoo. All right. So that very middle median number Basically, everything that we work on with data now are going to be in reference to what we call a normal curve. So this symmet is supposed to be symmetrical. Please just, you know, pretend with my artwork, right? So what we did with the middle, right, your median, as we found the very middle or the second quartile. So if we divide that in half again, we get another quarter. And if we divide this side in half, we get Q3. So this is what we call a quartile. So just like a dollar can be divided into four quarters, 100% of your data under that curve can be divided into four quartiles. With me? So now we have some mathematical expressions to find these quartiles and to look at these quartiles in reference to each other. So you remember earlier today we talked about with that cumulative relative frequency, if I know where, what percentage I stand up into this point is 30%, then I can also know how much is ahead of me because I just what? Subtracted from 100 because all of our data are under this curve, so eventually we have 100% of our data, and all statistics are interested in from this point on for the rest of the semester, what percentage, where did that little sample, oh, we collected a sample here, oh, we got a sample way over here. What percentage of this distribution does that point represent 
And is it different enough from any other point by, to be more than just a coincidence? That's statistics. That's comparing groups. So right now, we just want to describe this stuff. And then when we get into t-test, we're going to compare these dots. And then when we get into correlation, we're just going to examine how strong they are in relation to each other. And so that, so understanding the percentage of these curves is the key to being able to build off the rest of them, okay? So when you're getting into, um, you know, you've got your quartile one, your quartile two, and your quartile three. So what you're looking at here, if you were to say a percentile, that goes with it, what would be the percentile that goes with quarter one? You have one quarter out of a dollar, that quarter's worth how many cents? So what percentile is it? 25th. You have two quarters out of that dollar, you've got what? What percentile are you? 50th. Remember, this doesn't mean you scored a 50%. This means what? If you are at the 50th percentile, what? You're right in the middle. You scored higher than half of people, but half of people also scored higher than you. This is about your rank in relation to others, not your score on the thing. Okay, so if you're in the third quartile, if you scored at the third quartile, what percentage, percentile is that? 75th, awesome. All right, so you're with me on that. Now, there's this thing called an interquartile range or an IQR. And your interquartile range if you want to know, what, what, first of all, what do you think interquartile range means? Within, inter, right? Inter, with, like within, intra, right? Within. So within what? First and third, exactly. Within the first and third. Now we like to work with whole numbers. And this number's a little higher, so mathematically, which one are we gonna subtract? Which one number do we probably want first in this equation? Q3, right? So to find the interquartile range, you just subtract Q1 from Q3. <coughs> and so if I subtract, if I'm subtracting these numbers from each other, I can then know exactly what percentage falls between Q1 and Q3. Does that make sense? Because I have this number minus this number gives me what's left between them. Yes? Thumbs up if you're with me on interquartile range, quartiles and percentages, percentiles. Awesome. So another thing to remember is that in our data, sometimes we'll get data and it's just like, whoa, what number is that? Where did that come from? This is, this is an insane number. I don't know about this. And so we'll want to know what is the likelihood that that data point would fall in here or is it like something that's just like way out of the, this interquartile range? Because what do you notice about these two points under this curve? How much of that curve is taken up? Between Q1 and Q3, how much of that curve is taken up? The majority. It's 75% of our curve, right, is underneath this. So if it doesn't fall underneath that majority, then what can we assume about that data point? 
It's an outlier. Awesome. Say that word. It's an outlier. This is a weird variable. This is an outlier. This is a weird score. So mathematically, we're going to want to know, is there a way to determine if it's within this interquartile range or is it out of that interquartile range? And so to determine if it's beyond the quartile three range, you will add quartile three plus one value of the quartile, or plus the interquartile range times 1.5. And on this side, you would subtract that same thing. The first quartile minus interquartile range, oops, IQR, times 1.5. So when you add this number, this interquartile range times 1.5, you're taking it times itself, itself and a half to account for this extra data here. So what you're saying is not only did that point, if it falls out of this range, it didn't fall within the normal set of our data, but it fell so far beyond what this data should fall, this is probably a problematic data point or a very unlikely data point or something that we should probably not put much of our results or effort into as being like phenomenal because the likelihood of finding this again is very small. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, is that 1.5? <laughs> so, 1.5, yes. So, so this interquartile range, whatever you solve for your data set, you're going to multiply by 1.5. And then you're either going to add that number to Q3 or subtract that number from Q1 and that will tell you if the number is over that, over this number that you calculated or under this number you calculated, you have a score in your data set that is a major outlier. That is not likely that you'll receive data like that regularly and take caution with any interpretations from that type of a, that far off of a data point. And this is just one example of many throughout the rest of the semester that we will be putting what we call kind of a confidence interval surrounding our data to determine how sure we can be about what the findings were saying. With me? Confidence intervals, quartiles, or sorry, percentiles and quartiles. Yahoo! So, so yes? So those, um, those ones that give you the outliers? Those are the outliers, exactly. Exactly. So this will find the outlier above and this will find the outlier below. But in order to do that, you kind of have to plot your points. You have to know the majority of where they where your points land, which is your interquartile range, to get an idea of what is considered an outlier. Fantastic. So then moving from that you know, that median is really important in helping us. Um, box plots are just another way of visualizing that data. But I want to get into measure, measuring the center of your data. And so when you measure the center of your data, you have what's called a mean, a median, and a mode. And as we've talked about from chapter one, if you have a population mean, you're working with that mu, that little funny looking symbol called mu. So this is what a population mean is denoted by. If you're working with a sample, you're gonna see like X bar. And that's a sample mean. And a mean just means the average. And so in order to sum it, or in order to solve, you have to sum all of your scores and divide by n. Is 
That's how you solve for your mean. All of the scores, their total, the sum of x, and then you divide by the total number of scores you just added. And that's your average. That's the middle. Not the middle. That's your average. What's the middle? The median, right? The median's your middle. <clears throat> the average is just your average. On average, all of these scores fit here. But the thing about it, your, your median will always show you the middle regardless of outliers. But what's going to happen to your mean when you have outliers? Say you have one score that's ridiculously high. What's that going to do to your mean? What? Bump it up. Bump it up. You've got one score that was so, so low. What's that going to do to your mean? Bump it down. Welcome to the world of testing. Welcome to K through 12 drama, English language learners, and there are absolutely situations in high testing, high stakes testing situations where well, they will determine who probably will bring our scores down and see if they can be quote unquote absent that day. It's a mess. And all a score is, is your score at that time, at that place on that day. I've failed things that I know because my brain just wasn't in the right place at the right time. So it gets tricky when we're talking about test scores, but it gets tricky when we're talking about averages because averages can be skewed. Averages can be skewed by the scores that are in the set. Your median will never be skewed. Your median is always that exact middle point, regardless of the scores, regardless of how high or low they are, that median will always be the middle. But your average can be a little high if you've got it dipped in the high end and can be a little low if you've got it dipped in the low end. So you want to be careful. The average or the mean might not be the most representative uh, measure of central tendency for your data when you're trying to get a good descriptive measure. And does anyone know what the third measure of central tendency is called? So we've talked about the mean and we've talked about the median. There's one more it also begins with an N. The mode is beautiful. What's a mode? Most. What number occurred most? So I drew up here for you a picture of a normal curve. And there are other distributions, lots of distributions. And there's lots of different vocab words, you know, kurtosis and is it leptocurtic and platocurtic and all these different things that you can talk about with curves as you get into later statistics classes. But for your base introduction into statistics, I just want you to remember a normal curve, a positive skew, or a negative skew. Okay? So we've talked about the normal. The normal curve, tell, oh, <laughs> wow, Jesse. Let's not talk about that one. Your normal curve. Tell me some characteristics about this normal curve. Symmetrical. I love it. It's symmetrical. What else? differentiates it, right? There's something cool about the normal curve that does not happen in other distributions either. Because it's symmetrical, what do you know about the measures of central tendency? Yes. Awesome. So the mean, the median, and the mode are all right down the middle. They're all equal. Now, when you're getting into a positively skewed distribution, that means most of the 
data pile up on the left side and it runs, you know, out this way. There's less data and it points to the right and the majority of the data lump up on the lower end. This is what we call positively skewed. to figure out the mode because the mode is what? Again? The most occurring. So we would draw a line for the mode where? At the highest point. So everyone agree that's right in here? So we would put a line here for mode. We know that. What do you think? Where do you think the median would be? What's a median again? The very middle. So is that going to be to the left of the mode in this distribution? Think the middle is over here? No, we've got a lot of scores coming out. We, we have more scores coming out here. Not a whole lot, but there are scores out here. There's not a lot, so it won't be way out here in the middle but it'll probably be just a little bit to the right. Agreed of the mode? So we're gonna put the median here. Where do you think the mean would be? Is the mean gonna be to the right or the left of the median? To the right. Why? What do you have out here? We don't have many of them, but we have outlying scores out here. And it only takes one really high one to shove that mean up. So although we don't have a lot of scores down here because this distribution starts to dip, there still are scores out here. And those higher scores are going to pull that mean to the front. So if you have a positively skewed distribution, what do you think the next distribution is going to be called? A negatively skewed distribution. So what do you, where do you think the bulk of the data are going to be now? They're going to be on the right side. It's going to be heavier towards the top and that tail is gonna to point towards the left, the negative side. Okay, so same thing. It's probably easiest to locate which measure of central tendency? The mode. So where are we gonna go with that? It's gonna be at the, that highest point again. There's our mode. And our negatively skewed. Okay, so Where's that middle point gonna be? Are we gonna go to the right, like, like we did on the last time? Oh, yeah, good guess. We're gonna go to the left. So this time the median's gonna get pulled this way in the middle. And what about that mean? Same thing, keep it going left, why? The lower scores are gonna pull that mean towards a smaller number. So we have to know the shape of our distribution. It's going to tell us a lot about it. And it's also going to give us an idea of what might be a more representative measure of that, mo that um, measure of central tendency. And it's not always the mean, especially in a skewed distribution. <coughs> Any questions there about that? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so the mode is the easiest to find in a skewed distribution because it's the what? The most occurring. So you know it's going to be at that peak. That's your mode. But then you know that if your shape 
is normal, the mean and median are going to equal. Because you've got a normal distribution, everything's symmetrical, they have to be equal. But if your distribution starts to skew slightly, if you've got some scores way out in this positive end, then that mean is going to be higher than your mo. But if you've got scores that are down at this negative end, then the mean is going to be less than your mo. Because it's, it's that outlier that pulls it either way. And once we start calculating these and do an example, hopefully it'll totally click if it hasn't like brilliantly aha clicked yet. Is it close? We're close maybe? We're getting there? Okay. Any other questions? Because if you have it, friends around you have it. And friends on whatever video they end up with. <laughs> Sorry. Are going to have it too. <laughs> okay. Cool. So the only other thing, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and play on SPSS a little bit. Um, the first thing is, is uh, how to calculate this stuff. So we have to know a little bit about the spread of our data. Um, in order to really be able to talk about it. So the standard deviation is really just how um, far on average each score deviates from the mean. So if we were to calculate a mean and then we were to calculate the standard deviation, what we could do is we could take any score and we would say on average that score is two points or 10 points or whatever from the mean. So it just gives us a way to, to standardize where all these plots fall in relation to our measures of central tendency. So a standard deviation Again, you have to know some of those algebraic terms, but essentially for your population, what you do is you take the square root, so a population standard deviation is denoted with that guy, and you have to sum each score minus the mean squared, the whole quantity squared, divided by the total in that sample. And then you take the square root of that to get your standard deviation. If you're working with a sample, it's essentially the exact same thing, only instead of a mu, you're summing the scores minus their sample mean quantity squared. And because samples don't generally know everything. We don't have all the scores like we do in a population. We add some inherent error because it's just a sample. And every sample can be slightly different from each other, even taken from the same population. So in our sample standard deviation, the, de the denominator includes an n minus 1 rather than just the total n like in a population. And again, that n minus 1 is to account for the error inherent within a sample because we don't have all the data. So these are your computational formulas for any homework that asks you to, to calculate a mean or a standard deviation. So um, I'm going to take you because I went a little bit over halfway time. This is essentially chapter 2. So we're going to take a break, let your brain breathe, we're going to come back, we can do some exercises and pull open a little bit of um, Excel and start maybe plotting some histograms and stuff. So take about 10 minutes, uh, definitely hand me in homework here so you don't forget, and then we have another hour or so to play. Yay! Oh, you're so excited. <laughs>